In this video, we're going to talk about ethics and social media. Now, disclosure, I am not a lawyer. What follows is my understanding through research and experience. I strive to use first-hand and trusted resources in everything I present to you. But if you get into a situation of questionable legality, contact a legal professional. Saying, well, my teacher said it's okay, will not work in court. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the basic ethical considerations when it comes to social media and graphic design. Laws concerning social media and the internet are being discussed and fought over constantly. This is an issue that is fairly new since social media as we know it has only been around for about 20 years. Although 20 years may seem like a long time, I mean, for some like me, I swear Y2K was just a few years ago, it's not that long when it comes to laws being created. For example, the first car widely available to the public began being sold in 1908, but it took 60 years before a federal seatbelt law was passed. We are living in a crucial time since legislation on social media and the internet will affect generations to come. So I'm not going to go over specific laws here, but just know to pay attention to what people are fighting over in Congress and such. And also know that a law for the United States might not be the same law that's in another country. So these things can vary very widely. Okay, privacy rights and the fine print. So many people are angry because they believe that their right to privacy is being infringed on by social media companies. Well, here's the thing. Constitutional rights are a contract between U.S. citizens and our government, not between U.S. citizens and corporations. In fact, corporations are defined as a person with their own rights. This is also why a business can refuse service to those who are disruptive or don't follow a dress code, such as wearing shoes or a mask. They have rights as well. A social media company is offering their product, which is their social media platform, for your use, usually for free, as long as you follow certain rules, usually termed or referred to as terms of service and community guidelines. The trade-in is that they get to sell advertising space, collect data, and do what they want with that data, even sell it. Now, of course, this may change as we talked about just above. Laws are changing all of the time. So let's take a quick look at Facebook's terms of service. Okay, so we're not gonna look at this entire contract, but just know that by you using Facebook, you've already entered into this contract. And I'm gonna go down to this section on the permissions you give us. I want to talk about this because I see people posting on Facebook all the time things that say I do not give Facebook permission to use my photos and my posts or whatever. Well, they can put that on there all they want, but the truth is, is that you've already entered into this contract so they can already use your photos. So here it says that um, some content you share or uploads such as photos or videos may be protected by intellectual property laws. You own the intellectual property rights, things like copyright or trademarks. Okay, but, and nothing takes these terms away from you. However, to provide our services, we need to give, you need to give us some legal permissions known as a license to use this content. Specifically, when you share your post, upload content, that is covered by intellectual property rights or connection with products, you grant us a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, and worldwide license to host, use, distribute, modify, run, copy, publicly perform, or display, translate, and create the derivative works of your content. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that anything you post can be used for Facebook. They can use it for advertisements, whatever they want. Um, once you delete your, um, your content or delete your account, that changes. But just know that they do own, well, you own the rights to it, but they have the right to use it however they want. 
Just You just need to know this, okay? That is the contract. The only way to get out of this is to not use Facebook. <laughs> and this is not just Facebook. There is a clause in pretty much every contract when it comes to social media. When you sign up for a social media account, there's usually a place that it says, has a checkbox that says you agree to these terms and services. You check that without even reading it. Well, guess what? In there is a clause like this. That is just the fact of how things go. Okay, so if you're upset by this, consider that every time you see an ad on social media by big or small companies, they are using the data collected by the social media company to target an audience. If you are seeing an ad, you are part of the audience that company has set up for that ad. If you have ever taken out an ad on social media or consider doing so, you will also be taking advantage of the data collected by the social media site. So let's take a quick look at audience targeting on Facebook to see the data that you can use to reach your target audience. So when you go to set up an ad, you can go through and create a detailed targeting of the audience. And this is going to include demographics. This is all like the different type of stuff that we talked about when you set up your audience for your brand. There's also different interests. What have they liked? What have they put in their profile as their interests? You can target it for that. So let's say you have a knitting um, company and you want to target people who are into knitting, you can go to hobbies and activities and enter that there. Um, behaviors, what type of you know classifications they have, digital activities, expats, that's people who mo moved outside of uh, the United States, and all kinds of different other stuff. So um, this is looking a little bit closer into the demographics area. And I just opened a couple of these tabs. So education. So let's say that you need to target a service for students. You can um, say that you want someone who has an associate degree or they're in high school and they're going into, um, they, they might be going into college. What education do they have and is, their serv is your service going to help those certain people? We have income, so if you have a program where you are trying to um, <clears throat> get higher uh, uh, clients with higher incomes, you can choose people with higher incomes. Life events. So let's say you're a wedding photographer and you want to go ahead and try to get new clients by targeting newly engaged people you can do that. So although it seems like, you know, there's this, oh, you're taking my privacy and my rights away, the fact is that you can actually use that to your own advantage for your business as well. Okay, so let's look at um, some issues, some scam type of issues online. We're gonna talk about clickbait for a minute. So clickbait is a use of misleading stories and headlines to drive traffic to websites in order to sell products and or generate revenue from ad space. The more traffic or clicks a site gets, the more the owners of that site get paid for ads placed on their site. So warnings to look for are those misleading stories and headlines, which are usually sensational, over-the-top stories, both good or bad. Examples could be you won't believe which celebrities eat babies, or <laughs> we are giving away $5,000. Those are, you know, just think to yourself, if it seems too bad or too good to be true, it might just be clickbait. Clickbait is also used in what's called phishing scams. The goal is to get you to click on a site that will steal your information. So there's a couple ways that this can happen. Some phishing scams use malicious code, that is, once you click the link, software is just automatically downloaded to your computer device, and the software can do all kinds of things. Sometimes it deletes something. Sometimes it adds um, another uh, type of software onto your computer, like a spy software, so it could watch what you're doing. Another phishing scam is to pose as a legitimate website in order to get your information. 
So this happens, um, I feel like it happens a lot more with emails, but I could be wrong. I see it mostly in emails. So here's an example. You get an email from your bank saying there's an issue and telling you to click a link to log in. You click the link, enter your username and password, only it's a phishing scam and scammers now have your login information. They now change your password, drain your account, and open credit cards to start spending and sending money transfers. Okay, so some warnings to look for is when you get that initial email, there's obvious misspellings, grammatical errors, maybe a different logo, or unprofessional looking email site. Okay, these are all dead giveaways that um, it's a scam, but some scammers are really good. They make those emails and sites look legitimate. So if it still looks legit, but you're kind of worried that it's not, click on the name of the sender of the email. The name that is shown may say Wells Fargo Customer Service, but once you click on that name, what does the actual email account say? If it's something random, like, and I just typed in some random characters, um, and not from something that says like customer service at wellsfargo.com, it's gonna be a scam. So before you go ahead and start clicking on these random emails, check for that. All right, and now something else that we can talk about is clickbait, which is bad, versus affiliate marketing, which is acceptable and in a way kind of similar. It's just the legal route, I guess, to go about it. Um, affiliate marketing is when someone visits a site, clicks on an ad, buys the product in the ad, and the website owner gets a cut of the profit. This is a legitimate way of making money online. So for example, you join an affiliate program with Amazon, you write a blog post reviewing a camera with an affiliate link to buy the camera on Amazon. Someone reads your blog, clicks the link, buys the camera, you get a cut from the sale. So in this case, you know, clickbait is usually using some really outlandish um, headlines to draw your attention. But this is legitimate. If you're a photographer who is legitimately um, doing a blog post reviewing a camera, then it's not a big deal. And you do have to sign up with, for an affiliate program to begin doing this. Um, but it is a way that a lot of online bloggers do make money. Uh, it doesn't make a huge amount of money unless you're really, really, really well known. But it is another way. All right, moving on, let's talk about fake news and misinformation. So the spreading of inaccurate and downright false information in order to gain support for a cause is nothing new. For example, during World War II, the Office of War Information was created to create propaganda. Now, not all propaganda is necessarily bad. Some of the posters from this time are still recognizable today as patriotic symbols such as Rosie the Riveter and Uncle Sam. But the Office of Wartime Information also created posters that used fear and racist imagery to dehumanize the Japanese. So we have a couple examples here. Don't speak the enemy language, speak American. This is the enemy. And for my photographers in the class, um, you can see that they're using monster lighting, which automatically creates a more fearful look. Um, they're showing this person as an animal instead of a human being. Um, we also have this really horrible poster um, about skinning <laughs> Japanese. So, really sad. Um, but these are just examples to show you that fake information, false information, mis uh, this is all stuff that's been around for a long time. This is nothing new. This dehumanization had real-world effects. Internment camps were set up to house Japanese-American citizens and American soldiers sent home schools of Japanese soldiers. Note, they did not do this to German soldiers. So um, there was some propaganda, um, propaganda type of posters for Germans, but they still showed them as people. They never gave them this look that they are below humans that they're animals. And yeah, this is a really sad time. Uh, the West Coast was big for this. And um, these Japanese people that were interred were actual American citizens. 
and they were in internment camps from 1942 to 1946. This photo is was printed in um, Time magazine and it's a woman whose boyfriend, I believe it was, uh, sent her home this skull from a Japanese soldier and that's just horrible. Just think of if you've ever lost a loved one, if someone took their skull and sent it away to someone else, how horrible that would be. So with the global reach of social media though, propaganda, fake news, and misinformation are being used on a larger scale. Now, one of the issues with social media and algorithms is that um, they create what's called echo chambers. Since social media sites are set up to track what you interact with, it will give you more of what you want. So if I am constantly clicking on, let's say, um, camera reviews and like looking to read them, then social media sites are going to see this and start uh, showing me more camera reviews. So um, this means that if you're constantly liking posts, for example, of a certain political view, you will keep getting posts with those views. Soon enough, it feels like the majority of posts you see agrees with you because you're only seeing posts that are similar to what you interact with. This is an echo chamber. Okay, so next I want you to read this article on how to identify fake news. Uh, it's really interesting and it starts off talking about this Twitter account about John. <laughs> he has three to four thousand followers and his tweets regularly go viral except John doesn't exist. It's a fake image of a fake profile. So um, this is a huge problem. This is where fake news keeps coming in. So please go ahead and pause this video, go to the link and read this article. Okay, so now that you've read this article on fake news, let's recap. How to spot fake news, there are some ways that you can look. Um, consider the source. Click away from the story to investigate the site, its mission, and its contact info. If you go to a website and you go to their contact um, page and there isn't any contact information or their about page and it looks pretty iffy, it's probably fake news. Read beyond. Headlines get outrageous in an effort to get clicks. So what's the whole story? Don't just read the headline and be like, wow, that's what happened. No, actually read through the article. Check the author. You can do a quick search. Are they credible? Are they real? Supporting sources. Click on those links. I've read articles that seem legit and then they have links that say, oh, this is what backs it up. And I click on those links and those links go to nothing or go to obvious fake news. So check the supporting sources. Check the date. Reposting old news stories doesn't mean they're relevant to current events. Oh, this happens all the time. Is it a joke? <laughs> so um, if it's too outlandish, it might be satire. And satire is a type of comedy. It's ironic comedy that makes fun of current events. But I've seen people share obvious satire, but they really believe it's real. So check to see. If it seems like it's pretty crazy, it might be a joke. So make sure you research that site and author to be sure. Check your biases. Everyone, this happens to everyone. Consider your own beliefs could affect your judgment. Ask the experts, ask a librarian, or consult a fact-checking site. There's many fact-checking sites out there. Um, so yeah, definitely look into it before, especially before you share or post something. All right, so here are some optional articles for you to read. This is totally up to you. You do not need to read these for the class, but they are some pretty interesting information out there. So I have an article about how governments, politicians, and other groups are using disinformation to interfere in po politics. And here is the U.S. Justice Department's full report on the interference in the 2016 presidential election, which covers social media. We have anti-vaccine messaging, which has tripled during the pandemic. So public health groups are fighting back. And here is um, an article on how. Another example of misinformation is climate change. 
And for some of you, it may seem like this is a really new topic, but the truth is, is that scientists have been observing problems with human-caused climate change since the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. For a long time, this information was just, you know, relegated to scientific and political forums away from public view. But now with the rapid information sharing of the internet and social media information, um, it is becoming more widespread. So here's an article on how climate change misinformation spreads online. Okay, let's move on now to copyright and design in social media. From the United States Trademark and Patent Office, a copyright protects original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, and so on and so on. Um, so original works of authorship, that's also going to be things like photos, graphic design. So the things that we're making in this class. <clears throat> now, if you do want to uh, understand a little bit more about the differences between trademark, copyright, and patent, there is a really great video at this link that goes through the differences with the three. If you're gonna, uh, if you already own your own business or you want to start a business, you may want to go ahead and check that out. Okay, so this means that once you create something, you own the copyright. Now there are some cases when this does not apply, but that is usually laid out in a contract. For example, you get hired to do an advertising campaign. The copyright for the work you do may be owned by the company that hired you. Again, this would be made clear in the contract that you signed when you accept the job. Okay, so copyright infringement. This is something you do not want to note do. Infringement occurs when a copyrighted work is reproduced, distributed, performed, publicly displayed, or made into a derivative work without the permission of the copyright owner. So, just because you can download something online doesn't mean you can use it legally. You need to know that. People can track you down. They can sue you for using all kinds of stuff illegally. Now, there are some instances, especially for artistic and education purposes, where you can use copyrighted materials under the Fair Use Act. Now, this is... Um, a little complicated, and I did put the link there for you if you wanted to read it on your own, but for the purposes of this class, the idea is that you are making a brand for commercial use. Um, that means that you are trying to sell something. You are trying to sell a product or advertise a business. So the Fair Use Act is not going to be something that you can apply usually. So if you're using a photo, a graphic, video, even fonts for commercial use, like I said, the Fair Use Act does not apply. So you need to make sure that you are um, using these types of things um, from a source that allows you to, or create your own. I'm gonna go a little bit more into that in a second. But for now, pause this video and read this article on social sharing and copyright, what brands can and can't use on social media, and then watch the video below. Once you're done, come back to this video. Okay, so I know this has been a lot of information, um, and there's a lot of issues with copyright and misinformation. So what can you do to be ethical when creating for social media? Keep these tips in mind. When creating designs, look for usage rights. If you can't find them, don't use the photo, font, graphic, video, music, whatever. Um, it's better to be safe than sorry. And speaking of being safe, the safest approach is to make your own, make your own content. Plus that's just being creative and that's kind of what you're trying to do, right? So if you're making your own, you own the copyright. <laughs> so do it. And if you're creating for commercial purposes, basically you or your client is trying to sell something, you should be paying for commercial licenses for fonts, photos, graphics, etc. Or like I said above, make it from scratch. But that's the simple truth, is you should be paying for those commercial licenses if you're using it for a business. That should be part of your budget. If you're going to share something, check the source. If you can't verify it's legitimate, don't share it. And last but not least, if you're not sure 
about using someone's um, someone's creative work, ask them for permission. Find out who made it, send them an email, give them a call, whatever it is, so you can know for sure and you can avoid any legal trouble. All right, so I know uh, this was a lot, but I hope that this has helped you out in your creative journey.